You ready? Module 9. Module 9A, particular. Um, and we are now into chapter 13. Chapter 13 being um, the development chapter. So this is really where we're going to see um, people start to think about, you know, not just the sort of adult human being, which has really been the focus of things now, although, you know, with Binet and stuff, we did see um, some connection to children. Um, and, you know, obviously Freud has some um, discussions of child development in his theories too, and some um, parts of it there. So we have seen bits and pieces of it, uh, but it's, it's at about this time uh, in the mid-1900s uh, and, and beyond where we see really a sort of developmental psychology emerge. So let's go to this, module 9A. Um, cute little puppy and, uh, and kitty, you know, just saying, why can't we all get along? Look, it's so easy, even across species, animals can enjoy each other. Why can't we do it within a species? I, I like the picture, it was cute. Um, yeah, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start this section. I, I'm, I'm envisioning three lectures uh, as part of this week's lectures. So this one, which will really focus on this notion of recapitulation um, of whether the individual development is, is sort of a microcosm of the species development. We'll, we'll get to that in a second, and we'll talk about Hall and um, G. Stanley Hall and, and uh, Mark Baldwin as we do that. Um, I, I'm then going to... Um, just going to have two more videos, I think a second and a third, so there'll be a 9B and a 9C, and that should get us through chapter 13. Okay, so let's just jump right in on this one, um, recapitulation, and let's jump right in with what we mean by recapitulation. So, this is a sort of rough rendition of um, you know, various embryos as they, as they kind of develop and form. Um, and, and one of the claims is that you know, maybe uh, the human embryo, right from right from you know birth and onward, maybe it is recapitulating um, evolution of a sense. And the claim is there are points in the development of the human embryo when it resembles um, the embryos of other animals. Um, you know, when it's in fact no different. So what do we have here? We have um, so these are different animals. And, and what their embryos end up looking like. Uh, but this is what they look like earlier in development, earlier. So think of this as, I guess, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. You can kind of imagine it that way. For a fish, this is it for a salamander, this is it for a tortoise, etc. But the claim is that, you know, even for a human, early on, the embryo is, is you know, basically the same. That This is sort of an ancient embryonic formula, I guess, uh, and that for the first few months, there's not a lot of difference between the, these animals. Uh, you could say that a human's, you know, early embryo is just like many other uh, animals' early embryos. Uh, as time goes by, we start to see some differentiation where the, the fish and the salamanders don't really change a whole lot from that early embryo. Um, they just kind of stretch out a bit, um, but the basic sort of features are relatively similar. But as we go to higher species, I hope you're suspicious of that sort of term by now, um, but, but as you go and look at other species, you see more and more differentiation over time. But the claim might be, you know, this human embryo is basically recapitulating, reliving, going through um, that same sort of evolutionary process that brought it originally from, you know, a very simple organism to the complexity of the human being. Um, so this unraveling of complexity. Uh, so let's just, um, you know, said another way, um, this re recapitulation theory is, is often attributed to, to Heckel. Uh, and, you know, he, he's just kind of saying that when you're an adult fish, that's kind of like what a frog embryo looks like. But then it changes and gets more complex to become a frog. Um, uh, this, this adult fish actually looks like, you know, closer to the egg in a human. So it's much more, so it's still sort of the same. It's there in all of them, but it's just an early step in the human it then differentiates and becomes a little more frog-like, if you will, um, in, in the latter stage of development of the embryo. 
um, and then ultimately, in this case, maybe becomes a bird through all of this. Um, and so that we see these, these more simpler fo life forms in the embryology of the more, what turns out to be more complex ones. So this is someone that turns out to be a bird, but it goes through stages of looking fish-like and then looking frog-like before it becomes a bird. Um, okay, so let's just deal with some words on all of this. Um, these are important words and we're going to have a few words here because we are getting a little precise about language and so I want to make sure we're all being similarly precise. So one of the recurring themes in developmental theory is the idea of recapitulation. Um, its idea is most clearly identified with the biologist and philosopher Heckel that we see here. And then we get this famous slogan, um, which is which is so academic. This is so university. I don't think you could ever, uh, you know, I think correlation does not confer causation. It sounds kind of geeky. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Um, that sounds pretty geeky, I think. Uh, but the idea here is, first of all, recapitulate to restate, to review, to summarize, um, to you know, to kind of hold all the components of, so to speak. Uh, so ontology refers to the individual development, but phylo phylogeny refers to the the evolution of the species. So when we say ontology recap, uh, <laughs> my goodness, this thing's tripping me up. Recapitulates phy phylogeny. The idea here is the, in the, the the development of an individual kind of traces or restates or follows the same path as the development of the species. Um, and so there's this link between evolution in a species sense and personal evolution in a human individual sense, okay? Um, and so we have here from uh, Hackle that ontology is the short and rapid recapitulation of ph phylogeny. So this phylogeny is happening over a long period of time. Um, ontology is much shorter, right? It's an individual. During its own rapid development, an individual repeats the most important changes in form evolved by its uh, ancestors during their long and slow paleological development. So it's kind of, the claim is kind of like each of us and our own personal development is just recapitulating this development of the species over and over again. So this is an idea that's out there, uh, but it's a pretty central idea to a lot of development theories, and you'll see how they connect to it. So let's start with G. Stanley Hall as, as the um, psychologist um, who kind of got into this. Now, G. Stanley Hall is an interesting guy. Uh, as you'll see, he's really known for educational theory. We'll come to that uh, in a moment. In fact, you know, I, I was a couple of years ago honored to give the C. J. G. Stanley Hall invited lecture uh, as part of the American Psychological Association conference where I got to speak to a bunch of um, psychology teachers about um, educational psychology. Uh, and so that's what he is kind of seen as G. Stanley Hall is that education side of psychology, but he was really a developmentalist more generally. He believed in this sort of recapitulization, although he had a very Christian take on it and a very Christian, overtly Christian approach to his science, um, which is really kind of interesting. So, um, you know, in Hall's view, um, this, those two things were linked. Um, he didn't see evolution as a sort of competitor to religion at all. He saw all of this thing as interconnected. So not only did he believe that an individual's course of development was a summary of racial history, which sounds kind of weird, I would have said species history, but etc. But he also believed that the historical order in which religions emerged was in, indi indicative of their developmental status. Um, so he actually suggested things like, you know, a young child has a sort of pagan belief system. And so he saw paganism as, you know, a very early religion and, and one that um, is, is fairly well aligned with sort of the child mind. Um, and, and so that's why he claims that children love nature, they love myths, they love magical kind of thinking, all of that part of the pagan kind of view. Uh, I mean, some would say Christian Christianity has its share of magical thinking involved in it as well. Um, but that's the kind of thing he thought. So children are kind of like these, the, they have beliefs kind of like 
we did and went back when religion was very rudimentary. But the developed mind, the child that develops, will find itself more open to uh, a more Christian, more polished, more etc. religious sort of perspective. And, and so he thought everyone's born pagans, um, but the, if they develop right, they become Christians, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so let's actually look at his words to try to get a sense of this, because it's, it's odd to see this mixture so explicit uh, in the sciences. So this whole field of psychology is connected in the most vital way with the future of religious belief in our land. The new psychology, which brings simply a new method and a new standpoint to philosophy, is, I believe, Christian at its roots and center, and its final mission in the world is to flood and transfuse the new and vaster conceptions of the universe and of man's place in it with the scriptural sense of unity, rationality, and love. And so he thought psychology was going to be this unifying force um, where it would combine this sort of better understanding of our universe and our place within it with the scriptural scriptural um, emphasis on unity, rationality, and love. He thought um, psychology had the potential to, to unite these things and show how they were connected. So the Bible is slowly being re-revealed as man's great textbook in psychology, dealing with him as a whole, his body, mind, and will, in all the larger relations to nature and society. Uh, which has been misappreciated simply because it is so deeply divine. Uh, that something may be done here to aid this development is my strongest hope and belief. So, you know, just very um, religious views, connecting them with science and seeing psychology as a tool and method for literally, you know, bringing, um, well, not just Christianity, but you sense from his words there, you know, the real core of Christianity. You see things like unity, rationality, and love. Uh, and whether you're a Christian or not, those are, those are good words, right? Uh, and so he thought psychology could bring humans to this place of unity, rationality, and love. Big thinker, um, big ideas. Uh, and that's how he kind of approached uh, psychology. So he has this recapitulation kind of built into it um, as well. Now, what do we know of him and what did, he, what did he do that was so sort of critical, I guess? Um, the first thing that we often talk about is the fact that he is the real champion of questionnaires. Uh, so he really got involved in, in this renovation of the school system, I guess, um, you know, thinking about how education could be better. And one of the things he wanted was data. He wanted information. Um, and so, he wanted to know what children thought. He wanted to know what parents thought, etc. And he really got into the idea of using surveys to get that information. So, um, in a sense, you know, his original procedure produced data on 200 children, um, which showed that, in his words, there is next to nothing of pedagogical value um, in the knowledge of which it is safe to assume at the outset of the school life. Wow, that's a hard sentence. Um, because of the highly variable and impoverished nature of many urban children's knowledge, Hall stressed the importance of acquainting them all with nature and myth and a task that parents should accept. So this is part of his recapitulation you know, of religion view. So Hall really thought that young children should not be asked to think like adults, um, that it was wrong to try to push their mind into an adult way of thinking because that's just was not where their mind was. Rather, you should go where their mind is um, because he thought there was very important things learned during this sort of pagan period. Um, and so that's what you should be doing. You should be acquainting them all with myth and nature um, and, and sort of feeding to this sort of pagan mentality they have because that's what they find interesting and exciting and they learn a lot of lessons about good and evil and other things uh, during that, that part, uh, point. So, you know, it, it actually just highlights here that, um, you know, with his questionnaires in, during a two-year period, 1894 to 96, uh, he sent out 31 different surveys to 800 correspondents each. Um, and his analysis of the data was 
uh, grounded in that recapitulation theory. So yeah, let's just once more dive into him because he's, he's got a strange way of saying things, but he's also got this very unique sort of pagan view of children, which is cool. Um, well, I think it's cool. I think it's kind of interesting. The deep and strong cravings in the individual to revive the ancestral experiences and occupations of the race can and must be met. So he's saying this is a craving we have to kind of relive uh, and rewalk the path of our ancestors, so to say. So by tales of the heroic virtues the child can appreciate, um, so too, oh, okay, must be met by tales of the heroic virtue that the child can appreciate. So speak to them in their own language. Tell them these heroic myths, uh, and they can learn a lot from them. Uh, so too, in our urbanized hothouse life that tends to ripen everything before its time. So yeah, you know, that's what hothouses do, right? They get things ripened quicker than they would in nature alone. So he's kind of saying that's what we try to do to our children in education. Um, we try to ripen them before their time. We try to treat them like adults, um, but we shouldn't. We must teach nature perceptually in sight to visit field, forest, hill, shore, the waters, flowers, animals, the true homes of childhood in this wild, undomesticated stage from which the modern conditions have kidnapped and transported him. So he's kind of thinking urban life, you know, is not natural and that for, for a child to really kind of develop properly in his early life, you have to bring him back to his natural life um, because that's, he has to kind of relive that. So books and reading at this point are distasteful for the very soul and body cry out for a more active, objective life and to know nature and man at first hand. These two staples, stories and nature, by their informal methods of the home and environment constitute fundamental education. So he thought this was the critical first step. You know, get them out there experiencing life, interacting with nature and hearing stories. Um, that's the right way to treat a young child's mind and to engage it, not to treat them like, like an older person. That's what he gathered from all this questionnaire stuff. Now, I do want to stress, you know, at one point I said the mid 1900s is when development, we're not mid 1900s, right? We're, we're late 1800s now. So G. Stanley Hall was doing his thing, you know, right at the turn, right, right when the 1900s were, were sort of kicking in. Um, and, and so he's really setting the stage for a lot of the developmentalists we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, so yeah, I want to highlight this point. Because he was doing these questionnaires with, with teachers, with parents, and with students themselves, um, he really kind of united these groups. He became the person that was saying, hey, we are all stakeholders in our children's education. We should all be talking to one another. Um, and so it's a very applied kind of psychology he was trying to do, right? He was trying to understand the best way to educate children. Um, but he really started this connection of psychologists with educators and with the education system. Um, and that's something that continues on uh, for many of us until this until this day uh, and, and is a big part of what we now call educational psychology. Cool. Okay. All right. So now the other character we're going to talk about in this first lecture is James Mark Baldwin. So we have to talk about him for a couple of reasons. You may re remember we did talk about him uh, once before as, as being the guy, one of the guys, along with Watson, who was ultimately... Um, stigmatized um, because in, in Mark Baldwin's case there was a raid on what they called a colored house of ill repute or something like that uh, and um, James Baldwin was found within that house as a customer um, and this was a great shame at the time uh, and basically uh, required him to leave his position. So we've talked about that a little bit at one point, but, but here's sort of the rest of the story, I guess, or a little bit before those days. Um, Baldwin graduated from Princeton, went to Europe, um, studied with Wundt. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping you now understand why Wundt is the father of psychology. So many of these psychologists studied with Wundt. Um, and he became a devotee of experimental psychology. Taught at Princeton, Lake Forest University, received a PhD from Princeton in 88. By 1889, he became the chair of the University of Toronto. So this was really, I mean, I have to mention him because of this. I mean, he is really the, the one who began the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto. 
130 years ago um, that was set up and it represents the beginning of modern academic psychology in Canada. It was the first you know, psychology um, position like this in Canada. Um, yeah, and we're gonna, so I'll leave you to look at box 13.1, um, but he's the one that sort of started psychology at our institution, which is kind of cool. Uh, he then went on to his, to his um, trouble <laughs> down the road a little bit. He left U of T at some point um, and, and ended up getting into, into the trouble we mentioned. But he's interesting for a number of reasons. Um, there's a lot of things we could talk about with Baldwin, but in this, in this um, developmental context, I want to highlight um, a distinction that he drew that has now become really critical to how we think about development. And so I, you know, I want to ask you the, the, the following question. How does a child come to know about the world, about things in the world, and about how to act on those things in the world? A very nice, I, clever theory comes on the basis of uh, Baldwin's notion of accommodation versus assimilation. The words are there, let's just leave the words uh, for a second and, and let's do the example and then come back to the words, okay? So here's the example and I'll make it kind of fun. So imagine um, there's a child and this child has, has um, not been around too many animals, it's still very young, but you know, let's, let's say a year and a half, two, so it can crawl around and it can interact with the world. Um, and, and somewhere it sees this. So for this example, by the way, we're going to assume that all cats are nice cats. I know that's not true, but we're gonna assume that there's only nice cats in the world. Okay, so now let's assume this child sees this cat and um, maybe somebody in his environment says, oh yeah, go, go, go scruff him, go say hi to him. And maybe the child goes over to this cat, and maybe he scratches him a little bit behind the ears or pets his head or pets his back or something. And the cat responds by purring, and maybe cuddling in with the guy, kind of like we saw a cat cuddling with a dog at the beginning of this. Um, and so giving warm, affectionate sing sing signals back. Okay, so the child had a great experience with this cat. A little while later, it sees this. Now, notice this is not the same as that. It's similar in many ways, but it's different in some ways too. For one thing, it's got a very different paint job. Seems to be a slightly different body style, maybe a little bit bigger in some ways, but you know, matches a lot of features. So here's what Baldwin said. What our perceptual system wants to do is generalize learning when it can. And so it's learned something, the child, in its interaction with the first cat. It's learned that if it dis does certain behaviors, then it leads to a very positive kind of situation. Hopefully you can almost hear Skinner in your head right now, right? Um, if you scratch it and if you do stuff, then you get rewarded for that. And so you're more likely to scratch, certainly this cat, if you see him again. Let me pause this for a moment. Never, never paused before and came back, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do this. Okay, so we have the second cat, right? And so the idea is, um, Baldwin's idea is, the learning that happened with the first cat, what this person will first do is what's called assimilation, this child. It'll look at this cat and it'll say, okay, it's a little different than that one, but I'm going to treat it the same as I treated that. I'm going to assume it belongs to the same category of thing, and therefore I will react to it the same way. And so on first blush, it will ass assimilate this being into the cat category. We're now forming a cat category, right? And it will say, I think this is one of those two, and it will go and scruff its ears and scratch, you know, pat it and all that kind of stuff. And it will get the purring and the positive feedback. And it's like, okay, cool, excellent. A little while later, it sees this. Again, a little different than the other ones it's seen, but again, similar in many ways. And so again, Baldwin would say, it will begin by assimilating. It will assume this is another one of those things and it will scruff its ears and pat it and it will get all this positive feedback. Great, it's meeting all these cats and it meets this. Um, it looks like a cat, right? It's very cat-like in many ways. Um, it's got the four legs, got the tail, got the head, got the ears, um, you know, body in between, walks around the same sort of way. However, it's not a cat. However, the story is, if there were no humans around to intervene, 
the child would see this and would think it looks cat-like and it would start by assimilating, sorry, yes, assimilating this into the cat category. It would think this is also another cat. Um, and so it would treat it like a cat. It would go towards it and try to scruff its ears. And if anybody knows anything about skunks, skunks don't like people coming towards it. They find it threatening. And the skunk would turn around, lift its tail and squirt a horrible um, smelling liquid all over the child. And at that point, the child would realize this is not a cat. <laughs> this is different. Uh, and that's when accommodation comes in. So if, if the child begins by generalizing and treating this new thing as though it were part of this category, but then something different happens, something unexpected happens, then it starts to think, okay, this, this needs its own category. This is not a cat. This is something else. And that's what's called accommodation. And so eventually now it'll have a category for cats and a category for skunks. And so Baldwin thought, this is how our knowledge of the world built up. We generalize first, AKA we assimilate. Um, but then when that doesn't work, we accommodate. We make these different categories. Okay, so let's just read it. According to Baldwin's theory, development occurs through a set of interactions between the child and the environment. Uh, he used many concepts that became familiar staples of developmental psychology, such as assimilation, accommodation, and imitation. I didn't mention imitation so much, but Im imitation was be like initially the child reacts the way they did, probably because they saw some other child react that way towards a cat, right? So imitation can show it behaviors that it might want to try. Um, assimilation refers to the tendency to respond to the environment in familiar ways. I treat this like it's a cat. Um, habits which involve the tendency to repeat adaptive actions are the chief process. So if it worked for this cat, now, now you've learned how to interact with all these cats. So that's great. That's what assimilation can give you. But accommodation, by contrast, is the tendency to respond to the environment in novel ways that changing circumstances may require. So if something is different about this, you have to react in a new way. You have to learn a new set of behaviors towards that, uh, which you, may, again, may learn through imitation. Um, you know, seeing other people and being scared of a skunk may make you as scared of a skunk. So imitation is the major way in which we first learn these connections between stuff. Okay, so just a really important way, you know, as you go through the world and you look at the young children in your world, think about them forming all these categories of things, but not only forming the categories of things, but learning how to act towards those things as a function of assimilation and accommodation. Okay. All right, so we have some of the basic um, stuff down and we're going to move on now to talk about um, probably two of the largest figures in the developmental world, Jean Piaget um, and um, Lev uh, Vygotsky. Um, and so these are two major, major players. And so they will be the subject of the next video of this one. I am going to stop here. Thanks.